Melissa Hamill, who is a documentary filmmaker. And Melissa, when you listen to a, a, a panel, as we just did on creativity, one of the, the points of this is, um, is to have it raise questions, just the way art does, good art does. Did that happen for you? It did. What was it? It did. What, Let's see. Well, the things that I was sort of throwing around were, well, Mercedes Rule had mentioned something about, um, I, I forget her term, but I, th I, I remember it as being sort of derailed. I've always, especially as I've gotten older, thought more and more about wholeness, you know, just becoming whole. And I don't think this is just in the, you know, the world of an artist to be um, uh, preoccupied, occupied with this idea. So that when something happens that disintegrates you, a, a death, something explosively uh, uh, critical in your life, a crisis, um, even a young actor going into an audition and being treated uh, 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 cruelly or thoughtlessly and, you know, sent out the back door. There is a feeling of being not integrated anymore, being disintegrated. And the idea is you need to integrate yourself again so you can function. So I think that that's what resilience is, integrating yourself again. With this new information, integrating it in, not, not trying to forget it, integrating it in. For me as an artist and as a... I say new mother, but it's been eight years at this point. <laughs> so, um, just priorities. How to juggle the important task of raising children. Where does that space and time for ourselves and our art, and where do those ideal conditions go, and how do we create them? My parents were poor, quarrelsome, negative, sick, and daddy often stupid with liquor. I had to go live with my maternal grandparents when Mama had her third child because there just was not enough to eat. And then there's another part uh, in the film where there's the menacing father that's the drunk, that there's another mood set up. Whoever was begotten by pure love and came desired and welcome into life is of immaculate conception. None knew that when I was born. The human race does not yet recognize the sacred duty of parenthood. And you can see it with uh, Lois, uh, the background she came out of, uh, the parents, uh, what that did to her, and of course, part of her survival of becoming a person depended on resistance to those circumstances where you're dealing with these powerful figures in your life are going to determine so much of what you become or are. And it's out of that the tremendous resistance that she had this drive to be an artist. Threatening to kill us all and we had to hide the gun shells in the flower sack to keep him from killing us. So it's uh, creativity, but it's always also resistance. I think that's the psychological nexus of what uh, creates this whole struggle to share with others what has been such a source of joy to me might lead back to one experience in my childhood when I came home from school one day, grammar school, and found my mother had thrown out all my drawings while cleaning the house. I can still suffer that moment when I let it come to mind. It acted like a cyclone on my soul. This is Wendell Wiggins, and he is author of the Sipsy Swamp Stories, and this is a book set in Fayette, Alabama. Right. Um, and I know Alexandra Branion, the filmmaker. You played together when you were kids. Oh, yes. Her, her older brother was my best playmate, so I was at her house all the time. So let me ask you how we keep the spontaneity of childhood creativity in our lives, all of our lives. As a, as a children's author, do you, what, what enables you to hang on to that? I, I often just say I'm never grown up. You know, it's a, growing up is not such a great idea if it, if it means what it means to many people. I much prefer to, uh, to still play 
and, and being a scientist for a career, I essentially never went to work a day in my life after I left my dad's grocery store. I was doing what I would gladly have done without the pay if I could afford it. That's a pole cat, boy. Get them dogs away from there. Hey, you. Look at that, eyes, boy. That's a pole cat. I can't understand a pole cat, can you? Is he an Indian chief? Yeah. I got that Indian on my mind, looking better all the time. Yeah. I got that in on my mind, looking better all the time. Oh, yeah. Jimmy Lee Suttoth, he went through 26 colors of mud up and down the railroad track, and if he couldn't uh, get what he wanted, he would say, like, I want green. He would get pine needles, crush them with a hammer, and make green. Jimmy Lee's used flour with his mud to make it look like white paint. He's used coffee grounds for sake of a dark color. He's put axle grease with the mud. You know, in the South, like with Jimmy Lee Suddath, was you know was working not only on canvas, but was also was was out in his yard, was working with cray paper to decorate his uh, shrubbery in his yard. You know, so there's uh, it's it's something that that I think that does absolutely take over. I never saw anything half as exciting as the wonderful things I found in the outer walls and leaned against the fences and trees at Jimmy's house in Fayette. What a marvel, right in my hometown. You know, I feel like my, the public school system just squashed every bit of, you know, I, you know, creativity I had. I mean, you know, everything that was important to them was like math and science and all of these things. And I, I find it so separate from academia art. And I think uh, for me, when I work with young people, the two things that I try to impart is think critically about what's around you. And the second, give yourself the, the space and the time for that creative impulse to grow. Thank you so much. I hope you'll see the film. <laughs>